بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أضل أو أضل أو أزل أو أزل أو أظلم أو أظلم أو أجهل أو يجهل علي Before we get started with um, today's um, session, inshallah, there was a couple of questions. One um, you had last week, and um, there is a question that came through from, I believe it's one of the listeners because it's, it's uh, to, the, to, the, to the recordings of this, because it's related to Aqeedah thing. And there's a couple of points about it that I wanted to address um, about the question generally speaking and about the question itself specifically. Um, it's a bit lengthy, so if you just bear with me, I'm just going to read the whole thing. Um, and it comes from a brother named Ahmed. And um, he says that he's been having a few issues that need clarification, mainly with regards to the relation of metaphysics, physics, and Islamic theology. And the most recent issue is currently a really important one that he's elaborating on. So we've had a discussion with um, a Salafi who has some knowledge on the topic of theology and kalam. After talking with him, he left him, uh, he says he left me with questions that made me go and ask some quote unquote old school Ash'ari scholars. During my talk with the scholar, I could say that a jolt of fear struck me and by the end of the talk, it left me filled with anxiety, dread and doubts. Those emotions still linger and I really need to ground myself and inquire because the implications of what was said, if true, is horrible. I have noticed this before and I never said it out loud. There is a clear attitude of apathy in some of these scholars, in their reasoning and discourse. What was said can be summarized as follows. Um, makr, just to context, uh, contextualize this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when Quruna, Allah, Allah khairul makirin, that they plot and Allah plots and Allah is the best of plotters is the way that you would translate that. But makr in Arabic usually is related to deceptive type of plotting. So if you translate that literally using that apparent meaning, that immediate meaning that comes to mind, it looks like, or it might give you the impression that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would deceive you. And so this is the, the context of this question. And he says, Makr is something that God does to believers and non-believers alike, not in any other ta'wil or interpretation, but straight up deception. This is what this guy said to him. God deceives people, Hasha subhanahu wa ta'ala, Dhulm, Rahmah, etc. are ultimately arbitrary and meaningless while not explicitly saying it, but that is what was understood. Even asked, when asked about God keeping His promises, the reply was He can change points of reference at will or He can hide information from the believer, that's Makr again, like a hidden terms and conditions apply statements that the believer does not know about uh, that does need, the believer does not know about. A point was made that he does not lie, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but from what I gathered, it seemed like a point of adab, not out of imkan. So it's not out of the possibility, it's just that Allah does not lie, not because it's necessary, it's just good manners, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, when asked about hikmah, so wisdom, also through conversation, made it clear that it was in one form or another being arbitrary. All of this is to prove a point, the point of qudra or omnipotence. When put all the pieces together, you come up with a very ugly picture of the divine, which leaves me wondering how can one have a relationship with the divine like this? The source of certainty, of right and wrong, of meaning, is in reality none of those things at all. All you are left with is the Descartes evil demon, evil genius. So I would really like your opinion on this. How can a believer reconcile any of this? And is this indeed the orthodox position? Um, yeah, I mean, so just a general statement. Theology is not for everybody. And the term scholar is in our Western context not even our context, just generally speaking. When we think of scholar, most people think of someone who's just memorized a lot of things. So they memorize the Quran, they memorize the Hadith, they've memorized all of the different mutun, 
Um, they can cite off all of these different things and they can just reproduce it from memories. Prodigious memory is number one thing usually that comes to people's minds. Um, and the ability to come up with just the use of a lot of jargony type of things. Um, and spending time studying for years on end. And that's what makes a scholar, at least in the minds of a lot of people. That's how people think of a scholar. Uh, someone who basically does these classes where you translate a text, um, you recite the seerah, you retell stories of the companions, stories of the awliya, things like that. That's what they think of when they think scholar. I would have to say that we need to rethink that a little bit. Um, just because you studied a lot of texts on Aqidah does not make you a theologian. It just means that you read a lot of texts on Aqidah. That's really all it means. In order for you to have scholarly skills where you really are deserving of that term, you need to be someone who's actually um, interacting with this tradition in the way that it's meant to be interacted with, which is that it, this is an organic tradition. It is not just um, a code of laws that you can just pull up from a bookshelf and you just regurgitate. Whether you pull it up from a bookshelf or you produce it from memory, they're the same. You're a walking library and there is a blessedness to that. That's a blessed thing. I don't want to dismiss that. But if you're not able to actually respond in accordance with the people's state and conditions, and as we go through this text, some of the statements that he says, I've actually gone against what he says to do here um, in the text. Um, in going a little bit more deeply into elaborations of matters where Imam al-Tahawi says we don't delve into these things. And there's a reason for that. It's because you have to know your time and you have to know what people are dealing with. What was valid for Imam al-Tahawi, Tahawi's time, where he could just tell people, don't delve into a, a, a subject matter, doesn't work today when you're having people going through education systems that expose them to all of these different ideas and now it becomes imperative for you to respond. And it is not good enough to just say to somebody, you need to just accept it as it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent above all of that and there's no explanation to be offered to you. So when I explain things with analogies and try to bring the idea closer to you, it settles the heart, it gives you peace, it shows you that these things are not irrational, and then you start to recognize the validity or the value of the statement of don't delve into these things. But if I just say ahead of time, don't delve into them, without explaining why you shouldn't delve into them, without showing you the limits of our intellect, without showing you all of these things, then it doesn't work. So that's one. Number two, there is a tendency or a, 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 I guess it's a drive in our attempt to exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and, and basically make Him so transcendent that nothing at all makes sense to us. It's so beyond our intellect that we actually can't comprehend anything at all to a degree where you can't even have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things about pure reason, which is what this particular brother um, that he asked, so-called old school, old school Ash'ari um, scholar, um, doesn't pick up or realize that one of the things that we established is pure reason. For example, the law of non-contradiction. That you can't have two opposing things at the same time uh, happening in the same place. And Naqiban, you could have two opposites not be present, but you can't have two opposites at the same time. There is the necessary, the possible, and the impossible. These things are established through pure reason. I'm deliberately not going into too much depth into these things because we're just starting out and we're just getting our feet wet. If we were to go through this tahawiya a second round, we'll delve much deeper into each statement and you'll see different layers that, become, that unveil themselves to you. But just to get your feet wet, just introducing you to some of these terminologies and some of these subjects. But pure reason is something that you establish with it some, some, some parameters. When we talk about justice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you with uh, an innate sense of, of balance and what is right and what is wrong. That's fitrah. That's the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates you with. It inclines you towards good, it inclines you towards truth. That means you have, to, you have to have the ability to recognize what it is, which means there has to be some standard measure for it. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes that and He tells us all of that. But He doesn't deceive you. If there is no standard, absolute standard measure for what is right and what is wrong, and Allah just keeps moving the goalpost, then you can never actually know whether you're doing anything right or wrong, and it doesn't matter anyways. In fact, what this so-called Ash'ari brother um, was telling him, it's a nihilistic vision. You know, Allah is just kind of, um, it actually goes against the Quranic narrative, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He did not create things abatha, out of just playfulness. 
just whimsical, just whatever, just to have a fun game with us and be a, as the Descartes thing, the evil genius or the evil demon. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. We did not create these heavens and the earth except with truth, with purpose, with pointing towards, um, uh, towards the final end. And so I would say before you go ask, I, I would never go and ask a so-called old school Ash'ari scholar. You have, to, you have to be very selective with your scholars and you have to find out what is the background of this person and what have they done and what, what have they studied. You know, we have Sheikh Samir al Nas coming through uh, in the next couple of weeks, inshallah. And he's like one of those like last vestiges of like traditional scholars who would have st would have mastered multiple fields. You know, he did medicine and he did and he did the Sharia studies and he's a master of the Hanafi school and he's a master of the Quran recitations and he's d he does all of these different things. There's an article, an essay um, in uh, Renovatio, um, Zaytuna College's journal. That you guys should read. It's called "The Many Sidedness of Knowledge," is the title of it. I can't remember the um, the author's name right off the bat, but the title of the essay is "The Many Sidedness of Knowledge," and what that means is that you get to delve into different fields of knowledge so that you can have different takes on a subject matter. And no matter what it is that you're studying, you'll find yourself relations because the way the world is functioning, everything is related to everything. This is what that whole butterfly effect is about. That if you have a butterfly flapping its wings in, in Brazil uh, or in the Amazon somewhere, you can, it can influence the direction of uh, uh, a hurricane somewhere else because of the, butter, uh, because of the uh, cumulative effect that it started off with. It looks like it's nothing at the start, but it magnifies as it goes on. So I actually, personally, I'm always hesitant when it comes to people who studied and they haven't done anything else. They've just spent their times in madrasas and in seminaries and they haven't delved into any other fields of knowledge. And when it comes to theology, we discussed this briefly at the start. This is Umm al -ulum. This is the mother of all sciences. Which means that you as a theologian, if you're going to delve into this field and, and explore it further, or if you want to find somebody who's studied it, you need to find somebody who's actually pre previed and has studied to some depth a number of different areas of study. You don't have to become a master at everything. And this is another mistake that people make. I'm not asking you to become a master physician and a master physicist and a master chemist and a master um, literary, uh, uh, literary studies person or any of that stuff. I'm not asking you to do a master sociologist, anthropologist, but you need to understand the bases upon, upon which all of these fields operate on so that you can speak in terms of general principles and guide people towards um, that which is true. Because everything is, is, is imbued with a metaphysical view that the people have. All of this education system that we have is based on a, medical physical, a metaphysical view. It's based on the understanding or the belief that the world is, is what it is, that the universe is eternal, that God does not exist, that nothing has any purpose, that it is all random. This is the worldview that they have. And that informs the way that they educate people. It informs the way that you think about the world. So you have to understand these things and, 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 and find people who understand these things when you, when you get, in, get into it. Uh, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean Allah tells us in Surah An-Nisa, um, What, what is Allah going to do with punishing you if you are thankful and, and you are believing? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever most thankful and ever most knowledgeable. He's not out to get us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this view that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is out to get us and He's just playing this game so that He can punish us and we just live in this confused world. I don't think this brother who claims or has, been, has, has adopted this position of an old school Ash'ari scholar actually understands what he read. And he took this transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a degree which is what the... Um, uh, the enlightenment period was actually taking people towards which is deism. Deism is the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, basically the ultimate cause. He created everything, but then he just turned his back on it, basically, for a lack of a better expression, and just let it go, and just runs it. So, and he's so transcendent, he's so beyond any comprehension of us, where we can't even talk about his attributes. I mean, attributes are meanings. These are meanings that manifest in our lives. And we can certainly have some understanding of it, and that's how we have our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through all of our acts of ritual worship and, and beneficial actions that we do in society. 
But if you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely from all of this, out of fear that you might fall into anthropomorphism, because that's really what that's about. The, the fear for the Ash'ari is that you would fall into anthropomorphism, attributing human qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you can toe the line, you can show people that you don't have to go into anthropomorphism, you can still have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's real, that you can actually experience, and at the same time you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all descriptions. But you need to study to do that. And you need to study in a way where you're not just being fed the information and you just memorize it and you come back and when people ask you, you don't know how to answer that properly. So to Ahmed and to anybody else that's listening to this, um, justice, the difference between the justice that we understand from an Ash'ari perspective and from a Mu'tazili perspective, because that's what the Mu'tazila, if you remember, we said that they, they, um, they assume that their knowledge of justice is absolute. But you are a human being that is contingent, that is subject to time and space, who do not, who you do not have all the information. And so in order for you to make a, a proper issue of judgment, that takes into account proper, uh, uh, the, the context properly, you need to have knowledge of the hereafter, knowledge of the dunya, you need to have all of the knowledge that encompasses all of it. You have to have a basically divine knowledge for you to have proper justice applied. But the Ash'ari will tell you, you sense when injustice is taking place. It's not that we know what is just, but we know what is unjust. You can sense it, you know. So for Ahmed here that's asking the question, you know that just by your own fitrah, you rejected this explanation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna deceive you, that Allah continues to move the goalposts. You know that, you can sense that. But you can see an action right now and you can say, hmm, Taking everything into account, and from evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you know that when you take the Akhirah into it, and you bring the dunya together, and you bring the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the customary habits that the world has been operating through, you can tell when something is awfully wrong. There's like a, a transcendent sense of injustice is taking place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hasha'u, this does not apply to him. Um, the, the point about the arbitrariness of all of this is really just, this is an Ash'ari that's really a novice at this. They, to, call, to call this whole thing arbitrary is just to not understand the essence of or the, the meaning of what divine wisdom is about, which is to do the right thing at the right time, in the right degree, in the right place, um, uh, to manifest in the right way. That's divine wisdom. And to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is going to manifest all of that. And it is not arbitrary. It is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, here's a point to, me, to remember. The word random for us, and arbitrary for us, these words, when we use them, they don't actually mean necessarily randomness or arbitrariness. They mean... They, they are indicative of our own ignorance of the full scope of the knowledge of it. That's what it is. And to have true faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah when He starts off, you ask Allah for guidance in Surah Al-Fatiha. And then Allah says, okay, if that's what, هِدِينَ الصَّلَاةَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صَرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ I mean, I don't want to be amongst those who incurred anger and I don't want to be amongst those who have been misguided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to us in Surah Al-Baqarah. But what does he start off with? Alif, Lam, Mim. And if you look into all of the tafsirs, even the ones that try to explain it, they said, Allahu A'lam bi muradiha. We don't know what that is. The lesson from it that you can take, a latifa from it that Shaykh Hamza Yusuf mentioned um, uh, years ago, is that Alif, Lam, Mim, if you acknowledge your ignorance, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically will answer you once you acknowledge that. But if you get stuck on Alif Lam Mim and you say, I need to know what this means, you're not gonna get any further. So Alif Lam Mim is a reminder of your ignorance that you don't know and you ask the one who knows for guidance. And then Allah tells us, الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ You ask for guidance, there is the book, there is no doubt in it. فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It has guidance to those who have taqwa. Taqwa is this awe, fearful, um, but not um, scared. It's, it's out of the grand, the grand magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have that awe and that fear. And out of it, you protect yourself by not transgressing. 
and avoiding all of the prohibitions. Hudan lil muttaqin. Alladina yuminuna bil ghayb. That's the first thing. Who are the muttaqin? Who are these people? Allah says the ones who's, who believe in the unseen. Okay, part of the unseen is that you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom, Allah's justice, it's far more grand than you can encompass and, can, and you can imagine. We mentioned previously that when it comes to mercy, if you look at somebody who is a non-believer and you think, why would that person go to hell or why can't they go to heaven? If you have that much mercy in your heart, you need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is much greater than your mercy. And the, the khitab, the talk, the, the, the address in the Qur'an is regarding hell and, and heaven is for the believer to recognize what will get you into hell and what will get you into heaven for you to avoid it. As to what that person knows and what that person has gone through and why they are the way that they are, that's between Allah and them. Allah knows the secrets of the heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the conditions that person is in and why they are the way that they are. And He knows who's actually going to be deserving of punishment and who's going to be deserving of reward. So the same thing with justice and mercy and justice and wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are explaining all of these attributes. Make no mistake, you're not going to comprehend them. You're not going to encompass all of it. And that's really, and so to put trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Allah, you promise that you're not going to oppress. You promise that you're not going to punish. You promise that you're going to reward me for if I do these things. And you promise that you're going to forgive me. And that's why in your dua, you should actually invoke these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, you promised us with the name, through the name that you promised to forgive us. And through the name that you promised to reward us. Please forgive us, please guide us, please enter us into paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter, you know, like, in Allah la yaghfiru ayyushraka bih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive all the sin. In Allah la yaghfiru ayyushraka bihi wa yaghfiru maduna dhalika. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that he's been associated partners with. And even that one he says, لا تجعلوا لله أندادا وأنتم تعلمون. Do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowingly. So he even gives a way out to those people. That's the grand mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful who you ask your questions to. Um, there are a lot of imams out there who um, delve into subject matters that they have no business delving into. They don't understand the subject that they're speaking about. They're making very simpleton uh, claims about it. They don't understand. I mean, look, when people say I'm Ash'ari, you have to qualify that. What does that mean? Does that mean that you actually studied Ash'ari Aqidah or Maturidi Aqidah if you're Maturidi? Or does that just mean that you study with an imam or a sheikh who is someone who is Ash'ari, who is Maturidi, and you're just following that? There's a difference between the two. Um, yeah, so I just, uh, uh, that's, that's just that point. As we talk about the transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't want you guys to go away thinking that you can't have a relationship with Allah or that everything is so arbitrary that you can't even um, predict how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to uh, treat you. I mean, He tells us in the Quran how He's going to treat us. And it's based on our behavior. Shaheen, you had a question from last week, I think. Oh, on the creating the world, right? Why is it that we have this six days mm. narrative if there's no concept of time and space? So, so the question regarding... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using the term خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth in six days. Um, this goes back to the use of Arabic. I mean, uh, for us, let's just start off with us. Our concept of time on planet earth is that it is something that takes about 24 hours and change to go through. That's a day in English. In Arabic, uh, and let's just say in English, that's based on the Earth's rotation around its axis. Physically speaking, or geographically speaking, we know that the Earth hasn't always taken 24 hours to rotate around its axis, a full rotation. When the Earth first formed, it was rotating much faster. It would take four hours to rotate around its axis. So at that time, the Earth's day was four hours. In the far future, the earth is taking longer and longer. It's, gonna get, it's getting slower. So it's going to take longer and longer. And it adds a few seconds, I think. Or so. It's a very small amount. It's imperceptible to us. But over a long stretch of time, the earth is going to get to a point where it's rotating at a 36-hour rate. 
it will take 36 hours to finish a full day. So that's, yeah, that's just some of what the geophysicists will tell us about. The, and it has to do with the magnetic field and it has to do with the different factors there. So that's, that's our understanding of day based on Earth. But if you go to Mars, well, it's rotating at a different rate. So your day is going to be different. Your year is going to be different because the year, the Gregorian year that we calculate is based on how far away you are from the sun. And so a year is relative to where you are located from the sun. Right? The Arabic calendar, the Islamic calendar uses the moon phases. And the moon phases is 28, 29 days. So we calculate 29 or 30 days, depending on uh, the moon sighting. So that's, but that's dependent on the moon. Now, if you go through, uh, go to another planet with different moons, you have to decide which moon you're going to follow. And then you're going to decide, imagine that. You go to a planet that has multiple moons and look at Muslims in that state if we can't, if we can't even unite on one moon. So, this is, so that's, that's another issue there. And it has to do with all the, the atmosphere and how light reflects and all that stuff. So that's, just goes to show you just when we speak about the subject in English, how different varieties of it come about. In Arabic, the word yawm has different meanings. In the Quran, it's used to indicate uh, so walk through it, trot through it, uh, nights and days. The day in Arabic starts off with the sunset. So the, the start of our day actually begins the evening of the day, the next day. So when the moon, the sun sets, that's the beginning of, so let's say today for us it's Sunday. When the sun sets, it's actually this, uh, we begin in Arabic, we would begin our Monday. It's the evening of Monday. That's the start of it. And then all the way until the sun setting the next day, all of that is considered Monday. Layla is just up until sunrise. And then Yawm is from sunrise to sunset. That's what's been used. But Yawm generally can also be meaning both of them together. So that's Yawm, to indicate something related to time and space. The second use of it is um, uh, to indicate a particular, uh, a particular um, uh, event. So, Yawm Arafah. It indicates the day of Arafah, but it actually indicates the event that is Arafah in Hajj. Not necessarily the specific time span per se, but it's just indicating that. Um, the Arabs in old times would refer to Yawm Badr, Yawm Uhud. They're not speaking about the specific 24-hour time span in that way. They're just referring to the event of Uhud. I mean, when they say Yawm Badr, they're talking about the event of the Battle of Badr. The event of the Battle of Uhud. So any magnificent event that takes place, you could call it Yawm Kadha. So that's, that's the second use of it. The third use of it is... Um, Actually, another one is in the Quran. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in Surah Al-Rum that when the Romans were defeated in the low elevation of the land and after some time they will, So after their, their defeat they will, they, will, they will win. They will become victorious. So on that day, on that event, so that instant the believers will be joyous. So speaking about a specific kind of major event that takes place, not about the, the, the 24 hour time span as we understand it to be. We're just talking about the event here. The third use of it is to talk about um, the blessings of Allah. So with the bi ayamillah. So remind them of the days of your Lord is how you translate it literally. But the actual translation of that is Remind them of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, these are just three general uses. There are others, but these are the main three uses for yawm. So when you read in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about creating the world in six days or uh, you know, creating the heavens and the earth in two days and then four days to establish the sustenance and all that. When you read that, that is not talking about 24-hour time spans. That's just talking about um, uh, an understanding of time that is related to the event itself, which 
is really more about cyclical understanding of time as opposed to a linear understanding of time. Cyclical. So time goes in cycles as opposed to time goes linearly. In other words, we're talking about the event itself. And these cycles, each cycle can take however long it takes from our understanding. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that uh, uh, um, uh, there is a day that the account of it is similar to 50,000 years of what you count. So that's Yawmul Qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Yawmul Qiyamah, the event of the Day of Judgment, not so much a 24-hour day when everything kind of dissipates and there's no more sun rotations and all of that stuff. We're now being judged. So you can't talk about Yawm in the sense that we understand Yawm here, day, in that way. It's the event of the Day of Judgment. al Yawmul Akhir, the final day. Well, it's not really a day. It's, we're talking about an event. So time moves in cycles. Our perception of time is linear, but that's not necessarily the actual nature of time. If you go into studies of philosophy regarding time, you'll get all kinds of discussions there. One of them they start off with usually these discussions is uh, dreams. When you go to sleep and you have a dream, it feels like you're going through a lot of things. A lot of things happen in your dream. You take a nap and your nap is 15 minutes. But in your dream, you got in your car, you drove somewhere, you came back, you had a conversation with someone, you, like you saw a lot of things happening, and then you wake up, and it was just 10 minutes that passed. So your, your perception of time while you were asleep, and these events that took place, in, however you dreamt them, is not real. It's, it's a different nature of time. And we know that for us, sleep is another state of consciousness. That's different from your state of consciousness now. If you guys watched Inception, Leonardo DiCaprio's A Dream Within a Dream Within a Dream, that movie, you should check it out. Because it actually talks about like, our understanding of time and how it's warped and how it changes and, and how you can have someone go to sleep for half an hour and, and undertake many things um, uh, and many events happening in that time, in that time span. Um, same thing with The Matrix. You know, um, uh, Keanu Reeves movie. They go into this realm and they come back and it's like, these things are actually based on a, uh, philosophical discussions regarding the nature of time and how our perception of it is not really the proper, it doesn't speak to a, a, an objective reality of time. It's a subjective uh, perception of it. And we can't use that to cast a judgment upon time, generally speaking. There's a reality to that subjective experience, don't get me wrong, but it is not the ultimate reality and it does not tell us about the nature of existence per se. And what's interesting about this is that that actually, this simple point will cast uh, a, wide, a wide enough net to bring into question the nature of truth as understood through the scientific method. So when scientists speak about time speak about their, their studies and speak about what happened over time on the earth and what is reality and what is not reality and decide that this is the ultimate truth, that's based on a subjective experience and a perception that you can't get out of. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kahf says, مَا أَشْهَدْتُهُمْ خَلْقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا خَلْقَ أَنفُسِهِمْ I did not make them testify or bear witness to the creation of the heavens or the earth or even themselves. So for you, and in the tafsir, Imam Qurtubi says, وَفِي هَذَا رَدٌ عَلَى الطَّبَائِعِينَ And in this, there is a response to the naturalists. In other words, the scientists who think that they can explain to us what the nature of reality is and what the nature of existence is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, wait on now, I'm telling you to go through the earth and Allah tells us in the Quran, tread upon the earth and see how you started the creation. But then he still reminds us and says, just remember that you didn't witness it firsthand. So whatever you come up with, don't get too, too hot, on, hot on yourself and, and full of yourself and think that you figured it out. Um, and so something to keep in mind. So that's, that's just a general understanding of yawm and time as it's explained in the Quran. It's not how we 
perceive time. It's and it's in the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, "Yom uh, kalfi a day, uh, the 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 affairs of the earth ascend to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and descend on a day uh, through a, a time that is equivalent to a thousand a thousand years of what we count." But he calls it a day. The day of judgment, he says, alfa mimma ta'udun. He says that it's 50,000 years of what you count. So that's another event. It takes 50,000 years. So six days for the creation of the earth and the heavens. Well, before the creation of the earth and the heavens, there was no sun for us to calculate time and rotation and all of that stuff. So clearly it's not talking about that. So you have to go, to, and you don't have to be a scientist, a modern scientist to understand that. The companions understood this. So it's talking about something else. It's talking about a nature, uh, six events that took place potentially. Um, how long each event took place, Allahu A'lam. And it's interesting that even uh, scientists, geologists, they'll speak about these different layers of the earth and that speaks that that's the Paleolithic era and that's the... So they go, that's the Anthropomorphocene or... Like they go through all of these different layers and they go through these different time periods and they say this represents this time period of the earth. And this represents that time period. And they call it an era. So in other words, you can translate that verse from the Quran better by not saying days. Eras would be a, a more accurate translation for what is indicated by that verse, by that, by that word. I hope that makes sense. So, يَقُولُ الْإِمَامُ الطَّحَاوِينَ فَعَنَ اللَّهُ بِهِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ فِي الدَّارَيْنِ آمِينَ we stopped at uh, statement 34 in this text. So we're starting on statement 35. So the Quran is the word of God that emanated from him. Without modality in its expression. He sent it down to his messengers as, revel as a revelation. The believers accept it as such literally. They are certain in it, in reality, uh, certain it is, in reality, the word of God, the sublime and exalted. So the st 36th statement is, unlike human speech, it is eternal and uncreated. Um, this is a, a point that a lot of uh, people get confused about what does it mean that it is not created and what was the whole fitna about like why did Imam Ahmed get jailed and, and whipped with it and why did some scholars get killed for it and why was that huge tension regarding um, this uh, the statement um, that you have to believe that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time it is uncreated yet you are reciting it um, to simplify the matter for you the Ash'ari position is, uh, and it's actually the reality of it. To be called a speaker does not, uh, you don't have to produce sound. So when we say that the Quran is the speech of Allah, I'll walk you through this argument. To be called a speaker, you don't have to produce a sound. Because I can bring, bring someone who's mute, who through sign language, can produce speech. So you don't have to be, you're not called a speaker because you're producing noise out of your mouth. Do you follow me? If I bring you a radio or I take my phone right now and I play a podcast, it's producing sound that is words. But you don't call my phone a speaker. It's a device that is transmitting a recording of someone who produced these sounds and that someone you call the speaker. But if you remember, I just said, you don't have to be producing sounds to be called a speaker because you could be a mute person who does American Sign Language and you could produce speech, but in sign. So what is the nature of speech then? Speech begins with an internal reflection of the mind, silent thoughts, if you will. And this is what's called kalamun nafsi. This is speech that you say to yourself without producing sound. So 
you can talk to yourself without producing sound. Now, where is that coming from, though? In order for you to talk to yourself, some people, when they're talking to themselves, they're imagining the words. Like the shape of it, and they're imagining these things. So when someone says, for example, when you're doing your adhkar, if you've memorized them, some people, what they, what they memorize, and that depends on when they memorized it, actually. If you memorize the Qur'an orally, you just know how to produce it orally. You're not imagining the shapes of the letters. But if you memorize the Qur'an by going through the pages, a lot of people who memorize the Qur'an that way, whether they me memorize it page by page or wrote it on a lawh, they remember the specific action that they took. And so a lot of them, if they memorize it through the pages, what they'll remember is the top of the page, this is how it starts, the end of the page, that's how it starts, and they can picture the page. They're pictorial in that way. They have a photographic memory in that sense. So that's what they imagine when they're going through. But there's a lot of people that don't do that, and people are on a spectrum on this. So, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I don't actually imagine the, the letters. When I think, when I talk to myself, I don't imagine the letters. I can't see the letters. I've tried. I don't, I can't do it. It's really strange, I, and I can't explain it. It's just something that just, I know what the thing, I, when I'm thinking to myself, I'm not thinking of the, the shape of the word. I have the thought, and I know, and I can articulate the thought. But if you ask me at the moment that I'm picturing that thought, am I picturing the actual words on a piece of paper? I'm not. I know I've, I've, I've talked to others who actually can picture the, like the actual writing and the letters and the shapes and all of that stuff. And the sounds. I don't even think of the sound. I don't think of the sound and I don't think of the shape of the letter. I just think of the thought. And then when I want to produce it, I just produce it. And then it, it comes out in words or in writing. So the nature of it is, is it's these thoughts. Where are these thoughts coming from? Well, they're coming out of some knowledge that you have. Correct? Okay, where did that knowledge come from? You gained it from somewhere. That's how you have that knowledge. You learned it from someplace. You learned it when you were a kid. You learned it from uh, in school, something. And so you started to take that knowledge and manipulate it and think about it and come up with conclusions, things like that. And you, that's what you're talking to yourself about. So the, 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 the nature of speech is that it is an attribute of the knowledge itself. It's produced from the knowledge. You follow me? Now I can talk about someone being a knowledgeable person. Now, if you remember from the very first time we talked about the necessary attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one of them is knowledge. Allah has knowledge. Now, you and I can share in knowledge. I can say, like, you have knowledge, I have knowledge, but are they the same type of knowledge? They're not. But they're the same quality. They have the same quality to them in that we both gained that knowledge. We acquired that knowledge. It's acquired knowledge. And it is limited, and it's faulty, and it requires memory, and... Sometimes we remember, sometimes we don't, we make mistakes, we get confused, we have wahm also, which is just an illusion of knowledge about something, and then we realize actually it was not anything. Um, it's, fault, it's faulty knowledge, it's not real knowledge. A lot of it is based on conjecture, but we still use the term knowledgeable. This person has knowledge. Allah's knowledge is not like that at all. Allah's knowledge is all-encompassing. It encompasses the generalities and the details. It is not acquired, and it is, a, it is a, an attribute of his essence, that he has knowledge. But that doesn't preclude us from using the same terminology and say, I have knowledge, you have knowledge, Allah has knowledge. We understand though that Allah's knowledge is not like anything that in his creation. Make sense? You follow me so far? Mm -hmm. Now speech is an attribute of that knowledge. Sifatun lil'ilm. But it is not necessary to have sound to, to, call, to be called a speaker, to have that attribute of speech. It could be produced through sign language. That's fi'l, that's action. It could be produced through the tongue and the lips, that's action. If I negate, if I say you don't have speech at all, I'm negating the attribute of the thing that you have, which is knowledge. So if I say that, your if I say that Allah's speech is created, I'm actually negating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
a necessary attribute of knowledge, of ilm. And I'm claiming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I say that it's in his essence, then I'm claiming that he has created things that get into his essence, which is impossible, rationally impossible. It makes Allah created, and Allah is not created. So the Mu'tazila, that whole debate and the whole fight about it, was basically regarding the attribute of knowledge. It's not about speech per se. By, ne by negating, by denying that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah uncreated, it's produced from the speech of Allah, the uncreated speech of Allah, that Allah has an attribute of speech that is uncreated, you actually negate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge. Because speech is an attribute of knowledge. What is the Qur'an though? It is a type of a mirror. It is a mirror of the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our production of it is the created part. So when we recite the Qur'an, that sound, that's lips moving, that part is created. But that's just mirroring an attribute of Allah. Example, Allah is a creator. The creation is mirroring the attribute of the creator in the sense that it is bringing forth, it's a proof of the attribute that Allah is a creator. It's not the same thing. That's in a nutshell what this is. So the Sunni position is we want to affirm because Allah says in the Quran, وَكَلَّمَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا That He spoke to Musa alayhi salam. That He has revealed Himself in that way. He's, 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 he's shown Musa something about it. About, uh, he's given Musa that experience. What is the nature of that? Tawakkuf. We don't know what the nature of that is. What you're obligated to do as a believer is affirm and assert what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Himself. Allah said that he spoke to Musa, he spoke to Musa. You are not burdened with having to explain how that happened. And in fact, that is actually the path of shaitan. Because what shaitan will do is, Iblis is clever. He knows how we work. He knows how we function. He's been around from the very beginning. He saw the creation of Adam alayhi salam. So from Iblis's standpoint, he's like, I'll just get these people thinking about how all of this stuff happened. Their minds won't be able to comprehend it. And because they won't, but their minds are so powerful and they can create some really magnificent things. They will start to believe their own thoughts and then they will start to deny what Allah said. Boom. This is how Iblis functions. So your role as a believer is you come across these things. You say, look, I don't know. I just know that Allah said that he spoke to Musa. Full stop. We just believe, we obey. We don't have to get into it. I don't have to explain it to anybody. All I know is that this happened. Imam al-Ghazali talks in his Iljam al-Awam, um, uh, restraining the, the, the lay persons, al-ilm al-kalam, from delving into didactic theology. He says in that text that um, uh, it's very easy for you to believe your own thoughts and that is something you should be watchful for. That you don't believe your own thoughts. And he says that the burden upon you is to believe what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers said because what they said is the truth. As to the modality of what is intended by these things, you're not burdened to understand these things. And he says that the people that really have knowledge of these things are not going to be the theologians. It's going to be the people of ma'rifah. And when he talks about ma'rifah, he's talking about spiritual knowledge. That the more you get into this practice of this religion, the more you are consistent with it, the more you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He can grant you knowledge of things that you won't be able to articulate, but you'll just understand. It will occur to your heart, that's what that means. But you won't be able to share it with people. So why are we doing all of this? All we're doing, and the function of Ilm al-Kalam, and I remind you of uh, the first lesson that we held. The function of this is to defend the theology of Islam. That this is the path, the straight path, the only path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa tells in Surah Al-Imran, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted from them. That means that we have a religion that has to be defended, and it can be defended rationally, and there is no holes here. 
as we defend it. There's, I'm not asking you to accept something that... If you notice any of you that has had any difficulties with any of these matters, if you ask yourself what was the difficulty, it was always about you not grasping, not me telling you accept the existence of a square circle. Or 1 plus 1 equals 3. It was always something that was just like, I'm having trouble reaching that. It didn't sit unwell because it was unwell in itself. It was because you recognize like, I don't know if I understand what this means. And that's okay. That actually is a sign of a healthy intellect. That I don't understand. It's not innately contradictory. فَمَنْ سَمِعَهُ So 37 statement. فَمَنْ سَمِعَهُ فَزَعَمَ أَنَّهُ كَلَامَ الْبَشَرِ فَقَدْ كَفَرَ وَقَدْ ذَمَّهُ اللَّهُ وَعَابَهُ وَأَوْعَدَهُ عَذَابَهُ حَيْثُ قَالَ تَعَالَى سَأُصْلِهِ سَقَرْ فَلَمَّا أَوْعَدَ اللَّهُ بِسَقَرٍ لَمَّا قَالَ إِنَّمَا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا قَوْلُ الْبَشَرِ عَلِمْنَا وَأَيْقَنَّا أَنَّهُ قَوْلُ خَالِقِ الْبَشَرِ وَلَا يُشْبِهُ قَوْلَ الْبَشَرِ So why are we saying that this is not the statement of human beings? Because he relates to us in Surah Al-Muddathir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he's going to, to burn. So the statement translation. Whoever hears it, this Quran, and alleges it is human speech, has disbelief, for God has rebuked, censured, and promised such a one, an agonizing punishment, stating, I will roast him in the hellfire, because God threatened those who allege this is merely human speech. With an, uh, human speech. With an inferno of torment, we acknowledged and ascertained that it was the word of the creator of humanity and does not resemble human speech. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Buruj, but huwa Qur'anun majidun fi lawhin mahfuf. This is a Qur'an that is exalted in a safeguarded tablet. So, it's actually quite amazing, if you, if you understood the significance of this, that we are reciting the Qur'an, which is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, while we produce it as created sounds, we're actually gaining access to the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that. And this is not uh, in bibliation. So the, the Christians, the criticism the Christians have against this is, uh, you guys have a problem with us talking about God coming into the world um, and sacrificing his own, as his son and sacrificing his only begotten son. And Well, you guys do the same thing with the Quran. You just brought Allah into the, into the universe. Hashahu. That's not what we're saying. That is a, a misunderstanding of the position. We're talking about an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. We're not talking about the actions. There is a difference between sifa and fi'l. The attribute of Allah, His speech is uncreated. The fi'l is another thing. And Allah was always the creator before the creation came into existence. Allah always had speech before the speech came into existence in the way that it is in the Quran. وَمَنْ وَصَفَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِمَعْنَى مِمَّا وَمَنْ وَصَفَ اللَّهَ بِمَعْنَى مِمَّا عَنِ الْبَشَرِ فَقَدْ كَفَرَ فَمَنْ أَبْصَرَ هَذَا اَعْتَبَرَ وَعَنْ مِثْلِ قَوْلِ الْكُفَّارِ زَجَرَ وَعَلِمَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِصِفَاتِهِ لَيْسَ كَالْبَشَرِ So whoever ascribes any human qualities to God has blasphemed. So whoever perceives this takes heed and refrains from such statements of the disbelievers and knows that God, the sublime and exalted in all of his attributes, is utterly unlike humanity. He's just affirming. It. It's, you know, Tahawi does this and he goes, I mean, he, we talked a little bit about free will last time, but he comes back to it again. And it's just, you can actually simplify this creed even further and shorten it. But there is a, less, there is a benefit in the way that he does these things so that he closes all of the loopholes. That if you try, if you, and because that's what he says, Hada bayan. If you remember at the very start, he says, Hada bayan. This is the clarification. So it might sound to you like he's just beating a dead horse. He's just clarifying and making sure that you get the idea. Um, and he's closing any loopholes anybody can come up with. On the 39th statement, so after he affirms, a note that he first affirms the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as uncreated. 
And then he says, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and any attribution of any qualities of human beings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a type of disbelief. And then he comes back again to this issue, but he goes from another angle and he says, وَالرُّؤْيَةُ in the 39th statement, حَقٌ لِأَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ بِغَيْرِ إِحَاطَةٍ وَلَا كَيْفِيَةٍ كَمَا نَطَقَ بِهِ كِتَابُ رَبِّنَا وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ وَتَفْسِيرُهُ عَلَى مَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَعَلِمَهُ That the beatific, the beatific vision is a reality for the people of paradise without enclosure or modality. Just as the book of God pronounced, some faces will be aglow that day gazing at their Lord. Its explanation is as God, the sublime and exalted, knows it to be and has intended. So there is a, 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 a Qanun al-Ta'wil, as Imam al-Ghazali wrote. What is the rule for you to have interpretation away from the apparent? The rule is, if you see a statement in the Qur'an or in the Hadith that gives you any idea or any inclination to thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of human qualities, then you have to know that that's not what's intended. It's a very simple rule. You see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ سُورَةِ قَافِ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on a day when a saq is exposed, well in Arabic saq for the human being is referring to the tibia, it's referring to people's legs. Well you know that that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intending by that in that verse, because Allah is not like human beings. يَدُوا اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُوا اللَّهِ مَغْلُولًا So the Jews talk about the hand of Allah, and Allah talks about His hand being above others' hands. I'm using the term hand because that's the translation that's being shared, but that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here. There's no hand here. In the sense that human hand. It's as Allah intended it to be. And when pushed, you say, well, it's definitely, it's, it's as Allah intended the meaning of that, not as it befits His Majesty. So you'll find some Salafis that will say, Kama yaliqu bi jalali. That's how they think they're getting away with it. As it befits His Majesty. Well, you have a hand, Allah has a hand, but Allah's hand is not like your hand. No, no, no. We don't talk like that. We say that Allah knows what He intended with that word, but we, don't know, but we know for sure one thing. It is not how you think of hands. And we know in Arabic that a hand can refer to power, dominion. So you talk about the, the government is in the hand of the president. Well, it's not like you don't bring all of the people in the government and you say like they're all in his hand physically, literally. You just know that it's under his power. It's under his dominion. So when Allah talks about his hand being over their hand, he's talking about his power. His power is over their power. That's an interpretation of it. But you still say, Allahu a'lam bi muradiha. And that's the meaning of Imam Malik when he says, um, Al-Kayfu Majhul. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended by this is unknown. We just accept it as is. This is along the lines of Alif, Alif Lam Mim. That's why Imam Al-Ghazali said, even with, in, with translations, don't translate some of these words. So he says, Yad, for example, don't translate that into Persian. I think the word is Dusht or something like that. So don't translate that word. Because what it indicates in Persian is not the same indications that it has in Arabic. And so you might give the Persian a wrong understanding of what is intended by that verse. So just take it as is. Only time you can translate is if you know that you've got the exact, it has the same indications in the other language, which does happen, as it does in the original. So, and you see that all the time when we're trying to translate words from Arabic. We say like, ah, it means this, but it also indicates that, and it comes from the word of this, and therefore it means this, this, and that, and these are all the other meanings that come from it. You see how translation can actually take away from the meanings and it can, uh, in, a, in a wrong way, lead you down a track that may not be intended by that. So when it comes to these words, Imam Ghazali says, don't translate them, just take them as is. They're attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he referred to in the Quran. We take them as is and we just believe in their in the reality, however Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, indicates them. Now when it comes to this particular thing, just a, a latifa, just a, a subtle kind of thing about Arabic. In Surah... Um, I think it's Surah Al-An'am. وَتَرَاهُمْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the, about, to the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, sallam that Quraysh, you see them looking upon you, gazing upon you, but they can't see you. So nadar and basar in Arabic, in the Quran, at least in the Quranic use, they have different meanings. Nadar indicates, uh, basar indicates comprehension. It indicates that you've, you've comprehended the thing that you're looking at. Nadar does not indicate that. Nadar could say that you're gazing upon something but you don't really grasp its reality. You haven't comprehended it yet. You haven't even um, captured it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that uh, the Quraysh, the Kuffar, the disbelievers, they're looking at you, but they can't see you. And a lot of us have had this experience where you're walking down, you're sitting down somewhere at a coffee shop and someone says hi to you and they're standing in front of you and you look and you, it takes you a second to realize that they're looking at you or you're looking at someone you recognize. And someone is waving at you and you don't even see them and they say like, did you not see me? And you say, no, I never saw you. I swear I never saw you. Even though you were looking directly at them, there's an interesting phenomenon in neuroscience when it comes to um, uh, how the eye processes images. So when you're driving or when you're riding, what your brain is seeing as you're driving through the road, you're seeing the trees, um, the houses, uh, people walking, pedestrians, cars, all of these things are in your periphery. You want to be able to pay attention enough to know that they're there so you don't run into them or if something out of them comes into your way that you can avoid it. But you don't want to be paying so much attention that you can't even focus on what's coming up in front of you. Because that's how you crash. So the brain actually knows to ignore, to keep track of all of the periphery so you can see it, but you can't capture it. So if I ask you, do you know what kind of car is beside you? It's like, I don't know what kind of car, but I know it was a car. That's what nadar is. And basar is focusing ahead of you and actually comprehending and capturing what's in front of you. So in this verse, in Surah Al-Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ They're illuminated. إِلَّا رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ He uses the word nadar. He doesn't use the word, the word basar. So that's a subtlety to pay attention to in that verse. Which actually tells you that even in Arabic, we're not telling you to just have blind faith. There is an understanding that can be gained from this. So you're doing taslim, you're believing, you're, you're accepting. Um, what's up? You stop after you stole it. Oh, you could have said something, man. <laughs> no, no, yeah, just no, yeah. it's okay. You know where it is, right? Yep. Okay. So while still having taslim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're saying that, alhamdulillah, you know, this is Allah's, uh, we accept what Allah intended by this. Um, but beyond that, we know that what these words are not randomly chosen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose specifically إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةً as opposed to إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا مُفْسَرَةً That would have given you a different indication. I mean, basira, it's interesting. Um, the word basira, which comes from the root of basar, which is, again, يُبْصِرُ like to see something, to capture something. Basira is insight. It's to know the essence of something. To go beyond the apparent uh, the appearances and to just get to the root uh, of the matter. That's basira. That's having insight. And that is a function of the heart. It's not even a function of the eye. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a word that is indicating that you'll see, but you won't capture. You won't comprehend. What will happen? We don't know. We just do taslim. And that's why he says, وَكُلُّ مَا جَاءَ فِي ذَلِكَ وَتَفْسِيرُ عَلَى مَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَعِلْمَهُ this is how it's to be interpreted. It's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. The 40th statement, وَكُلُّ مَا جَاءَ فِي ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ الصَّحِيحِ عَنَ الرَّسُولِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَهُوَ كَمَا قَالَ وَمَعْنَاهُ عَلَى مَا أَرَادَ لَا نَدْخُلُ فِي ذَلِكَ مُتَأَوِّلِينَ بِآرَائِنَا وَلَا مُتَوَهِّمِينَ بِأَهْوَائِنَا So he says that all that, come, uh, all that came to us from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic hadith is just as he said it was and the meaning is as he intended. We do not interpret any of it to accord with our opinions nor do we presume any of it to accord with our whims. This is an important um, uh, pause for us to take here. Which is a point I mentioned earlier. Um, we, we, 
the questions that are people uh, that people are coming up with today regarding belief, faith, the nature of reality, uh, what do you believe about God, and the questions that they're asking you, the whole advent of ilm al-kalam, generally speaking, and why Muslims got into this whole area, was because Islam started to spread to Persia and the Roman Empire, and we had people coming from the Jewish tradition, people coming from the Zoroastrian tradition, people coming from atheistic traditions, just philosophers, materialists, from all walks of life coming through and interacting with Muslims and started to pose questions. Now, the um, people tell you like, well, what was good for the Sahaba is good for us. We don't want to get into that. That's a false analogy, that's an equivocation. The example that you can use here, which is something that Sheikh Sa'id Fawde uses in his commentary on this text, which is a beautiful example. He says the Sahaba are like the people who were just chilling. They didn't have a battle to fight. They didn't have, they're just hanging around and they didn't need weapons. And meanwhile, us, it's like the example of a people in the middle of a battle. You're not going to tell us that you don't need weapons because the Sahaba didn't need weapons. And what was good for the Sahaba is good for you. You'll get slaughtered. So what the tabi'een and tabi'een and tabi'een and the people that got into this realm and started to talk about it, they got into it out of necessity. Now their reality was much more benign than what we have right now. We have an all-out attack and assault against all types of belief, religious faith, God, the Prophet wasallam, the Qur'an, spirituality, all of that. It's just an all-out attack. And it takes place from the very beginning with children as soon as they enter into school. I know that you think that you're, they're just studying benign things, but they're not benign. In education, they have what's called the implicit curriculum and the explicit, uh, the explicit curriculum. Implicit deliverables. Implicit are things that are not necessarily um, measured by a report card. But they're going to tell you, like, by the time of this, by the end of this semester, the student should be able to, one, two, three, four, five, six... And part of these things have to do with character, with orientation to the world, with how they think, how they interact, things like that. Well, where is that coming from? It's coming out of a value system. Where is that value system coming from? It's coming from an ethical and a metaphysical orientation. And so you, if you're not going to get into these things and you're going to say, like, we're just going to believe it as is and we're not going to discuss it. Well, I've, I've personally talked to enough ki kids in high school to know that that's not going to work. And so you have to start from a young age. And the way that you start with these things is you don't explain, this is actually valid for somebody in elementary school and in middle school to teach. At a most basic level, just here are the beliefs. Before they even start to read, uh, to read and write. If you remember when Imam Fode was, uh, was in town, the first thing he said and he was recommending was, don't get into reading and writing early on. Kids learn through storytelling. They're in an oral phase. And so you need to teach them oral traditions. Just have them memorize. They're beautiful in that way. And their questions are actually very simple. And they don't go into too much philosophical, uh, in-depth discussions. Very deep the philosophical questions they ask, but they're satisfied with direct answers. They don't obfuscate. So you explain to them things orally. Memorize, learn, pray, do your, you know, just do the rituals and acts of worship and all that. Inculcate in them through planting of the seeds the, the, the principles of this religion. And as they grow older, then you can go, all right, we've studied this text before. Let's get into it into a more intermediate level of depth. And then after they go through it and they comprehend and they understand properly, then you go like, all right, time for us to go into it a third time. But this time we're going to go even deeper. If they're interested to go into deeper and deeper depths of this. But at the basic level, you just go basic. High school, they're studying philosophy now and they're coming up with questions. First year university, they're going to get asked questions they're not going to know how to answer. And so they're going to have doubts being sowed into them. And the function of this knowledge, of this ilm al-kalam, is to respond to these challenges that these kids are coming up with. And you cannot say, we don't interpret, we don't in involve, we don't engage. You have to explain the nature of the intellect, the limits of the intellect, um, the subtleties of linguistic meanings that you can derive out of this how we can still have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while still maintaining His transcendence, that He is nothing like unto uh, any of His creations, um, and so on and so forth. So this point that He says, that everything is tr uh, from the authentic hadith of, of the Prophet sallallahu is as He said and as they wanted to mean. Yes, we acknowledge all of that. But that does not preclude us from trying to 
explain in a contextual way how this belief, this religion is not anti-pure um, reason. It is not irrational. That what we're saying are things that are perfectly in line with a rational believing person to have and they do not make you into a silly person. Who would dis- and that's not about, um, oh, we don't care about the opinions of the disbelievers. Of course we don't. I don't care about the opinions of disbelievers. I mean, I get asked, uh, do you believe in jinn? Yeah, I do. The jinn exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them in the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ told us about them. They're a reality of existence. So I'm not shy to accept, to acknowledge that and to say that. But that's with, with, with a conviction that is rooted in knowledge. Not, as a, not a conviction that is just blind faith because my parents told me so. So it's important to keep these things in mind. And to remember... وَلَا مُتَوَهِمِينَ بِأَهْوَائِنَا That we do not presume uh, any of it in accord with our whims. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali talks about as well. Don't just believe your thoughts. As we explain these things, as we come up with interpretations, as we share with you what the scholars have said about these things, just recognize this is human attempts to understand revelation. They're limited. And we could very well be wrong. And so how do we save ourselves? We say... This is according to my understanding of this matter. But I believe what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted out of it. Even if it's not what I thought it is, I accept what Allah wants. فَإِنَّهُ مَا سَلِمَ So the 41st statement, فَإِنَّهُ مَا سَلِمَ فِي دِينِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ سَلَّمَ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَلِرَسُولِهِ صَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَرَدَّ عِلْمَ مَا اشْتَبَهَ عَلَيْهِ إِلَى عَالِمِهِ For no one is secure in his religion unless he resigns himself to God, the sublime and exalted, and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and consigns whatever obscures his understanding to the one who knows its meaning. It's the safest thing you can do. And don't be shy to say, I don't know. It doesn't uh, negate your faith. It does not diminish your faith. It does not make your faith any weaker. Your belief in Islam can still be solid on solid grounds, while at the same time saying, Look at, I mean, look at these atheists that talk about, um, you know, they're followers of scientism. That talk about science like the ultimate way of knowing the truth and everything. They, they espouse, they're just glee, with so much glee. They talk about, oh, we don't know this, we don't know that, we don't know that. But what we do know is the scientific method is the way to answer these questions. They're not shy about it. They're emboldened by their ignorance. It's actually quite amazing. So for us, we have to just say, like, look, me not knowing something. There's an understanding or there is an assumption of, from the atheists at least, and some believers have taken that on, that just because you believe in God, that you should have the answers to everything. And that's not true. There's plenty of things we don't know. In fact, me submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is an acknowledgement. As we mentioned earlier, Alif la Mim, I don't know what that means. It's because I'm an ignorant person that I'm submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm accepting of whatever knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants me. And I'm thankful for it. But I don't expect to know everything. And if someone asks you a question, I don't know. Go ask the people of knowledge. Don't burden yourself with having to know everything. Some of you at work and, and you get questions and stuff, don't be shy to just say, like, well, that's a good question. I have no idea. You know, and if it's not within your purview and not within your interest, go like, look, man, I don't know what your what the answer is. I can try to direct you to somebody, maybe, but if you're interested to know, but I'm good. I, like, I don't know, and I don't need to know, and I don't care to know. I have other things. I'm too busy. There's nothing wrong with you saying that. I'm just walking away. ولا تثبت قدم الإسلام إلا على ظهر التسليم والاستسلام. One's footing in Islam is not firm save on, uh, save on the ground of resignation and surrender. If you make it a condition for everything that you believe or everything that you get from Islam, um, make it a condition that I have to understand the wisdom and the explanation behind everything that I get, you're going to be on very, very shaky grounds. Because all it will take is one thing to come through where you don't understand the wisdom behind it. And I'm talking about something authentic, something that's actually like part of the tradition. And if you don't understand it, then to say, well, I guess it's not for me. 
And that actually is a sign that you weren't submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. That was a, that's a sign that you are worshipping your own intellect. Which is the kind of metaphorical hidden idol of this age. We all worship our intellects. That's not to say that you can't ask questions. One advice I got, and I repeated this several times before in different settings. A beautiful brother, um, Hamid al-Harbi. Um, we're back at uh, the university and, and I asked a couple questions. And he said to me, look, any question that you come up with, you need to know two things about it. The first one is you're not the first one to ask it. So don't think you're Mr. Clever or that I've, like, I've come up with something that hasn't come up with before. It's been asked before. And the second thing you need to know is that it's been answered. So your task is to be patient to find the answer. And you can't say, I guess sometimes people tell us, like, I asked like five shiuch, I asked ten shiuch. Maybe it was the eleventh sheikh that was going to give you the answer. You just gave up after ten shiuch. There are people that have a question that percolates in their mind for 30, 40, 50 years until they finally come up with somebody they didn't expect to have the answer who just gives them the answer. So as long as, and every question people have, like there are no questions related to our foundational beliefs that you can, uh, that you can come up with except that you can get a ready-made answer right away, like we can tell you what the answer is. But a lot of the questions people have are actually not about foundations of this religion. They're about side issues. They're about furu'ah. They're about branches of this religion. People that have questions about, oh, what about slavery? Or what about women? Or what about this? And, okay, these are all branches now we're talking about, related to fiqh nonetheless, by the way. So far, I've yet to meet a single person who has left Islam or has doubts about Islam that wasn't related to, a, that wasn't about an issue of, of law. It was always about law. Not a single person came to me with a thing about theology. Like, I have a problem with a specific... And even when it came to theology, the theoretical questions that I have seen, which didn't come from actual people, were to do with branches of theology. They weren't even about the foundations of it. So the foundations of the faith are established, they're firm, there's no questions about them. They're all sensical, they're all rational. But then branches of it, all oh, the problem of evil, for example, or free will, or things... Now we're talking about branches related to human beings, and that's when people start to have issues. Well, you know what? I, every time I've had a question, I've always just put it in a bank in the back of my mind. I said, like, that's an interesting question. Maybe I'll come across it. And it never fails. I always just, throughout my readings and my studies, I come up with something. I was like, subhanAllah, that's exactly what I was wondering about. The answer is there. And I just, and I find it sometimes in a well-known text, sometimes in an obscure text. Who knows? But I keep it in the back of my mind. It doesn't shake my faith. It doesn't shake my belief in Islam. It's just like, that's interesting. And that's the approach that you should have. You believe in this religion? Be firm upon it. That's it. Questions that people come up with regards to evolutionary theory and stuff. You're talking about uh, matters related to the creation of human beings. Like, let's just... I accept what Allah said. Regardless of what I come up with and what I find out through the scientific method, it's like, I don't care. You know, it's... Even if I come up across things that seem to contradict what I'm coming up with, I, my primary belief is Allah, He's the creator of everything, and He told us what he, He's done all of this. Okay, khalas, tislim. I accept that. Anything else? Keep it on the back of your mind. That's interesting. That doesn't add up. Imam Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, in his text, uh, in his commentary on Sahih al Bukhari, he's commenting on a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ talks about Adam السلام, being 60 arm spans tall. And Imam Ibn Hajar says, um, well, we've passed by the people of Ad where they used to live and Thamud and their time is closer to the time of Adam السلام, but their houses are the same height as our houses which means that their heights are the same as our heights and that doesn't make sense they should have, if people are getting shorter they should have been much taller than we are but they're not and then he says I haven't come across anything that would remove this conundrum, this paradox. And then he just moves on to the next hadith. He's like, uh, that's interesting. It's a finding. That's an acknowledgement of his own limitations. Like, I haven't come across something to remove this issue. Instead of the modern approach is, let's reject the hadith because the hadith is nonsensical because people are this or that. No, I, like... 
I don't know what this hadith is indicating. Uh, it's indicating something, but my experience of the world is saying something else. This is a paradox. It's not a contradiction. A paradox is different from a contradiction. A contradiction is something that you have the knowledge of both of them completely, and then you're saying they don't fit. They're contradicting. Paradox is there is a gap in your knowledge. You know something about this. You know something about this. On the apparent, uh, the apparent of it, it looks like it's contradicting, uh, contradicting each other, but I'm limited in my knowledge. Therefore, I'm just going to stop. I don't know what this is. Maybe I'll come up with a resolution later on. So you really have to establish your footing in Islam and just ask yourself that question, why am I a believer? It's because, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, all these things are congruent with pure reason, I've arrived at them, my fitrah is, is in line with all of this. These are the foundational, foundational beliefs of this religion. I accept everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended it, I'm going to try to understand as much as I can, but when I don't understand, it doesn't matter. فَمَنْ رَامَ عِلْمَ مَا حُضِرَ عَنْهُ عِلْمُهُ وَلَمْ يَقْنَعْ بِالتَّسْلِيمِ فَهْمُهُ حَجَبَهُ مَرَامُهُ عَنْ خَالِصُ التَّوْحِيدِ وَصَافِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ وَصَحِيحِ الْإِيمَانِ فَيَتَذَبْذَبُ بَيْنَ الْكُفْرِ وَالْإِيمَانِ وَالتَّصْدِيقِ وَالتَّكْذِيبِ وَالْإِقْرَارِ وَالْإِنْكَارِ مُوَسْوِسًا تَائِهًا شَاكًا زَائِغًا لَا مُؤْمِنًا مُصَدِّقًا وَلَا جَاحِدًا مُكَذِّبًا This is such a profound statement here. Whoever covets knowledge that was barred from him. So you didn't understand something and you just made it a point like I need to understand this thing and otherwise I'm not going to actually be a, a, a firm believer. Be veiled from uh, this person, discontented with the limits of his understanding, shall be veiled from pure unity, unadulterated comprehension, and sound faith on account of his covetousness. He will then vacillate, uh, vacillate between belief and disbelief, assertion and negation, and resolution and denial, obsessive, aimless, skeptical, and deviant. He is neither an assertive believer nor a resolute denier. That's a pretty terrible state to be in. That you're, you're in between. I'm not this and I'm not that. I don't know this and I don't. And when you go into it, you find out that actually the problem is not with the belief itself. The problem is with the person. And what they predicated their belief on. وَلَا يَصِحُ الْإِيمَانُ بِالرُّؤْيَةِ لِأَهْلِ دَارِ السَّلَامِ لِمَنْ اعْتَبَرَهَا مِنْهُمْ بِوَهْمٍ أَوْ تَأَوَّلَهَا بِفَهْمٍ إذ كان تأويل الرؤية وتأويل كل معنى كل معنى يضاف إلى الربوبية بترك التأويل ولزوم التسليم وعليه دين المسلمين وشرائع وشرائع شرائع النبيين. Belief in the beatific vision of the denizens of paradise is incorrect for anyone who surmises that it is imaginary or interprets it to be a type of comprehension. For correct interpretation of the beatific vision or any quality and next to lordship lies in leaving interpretation and cleaving to resignation. Upon this are based the religion of the Muslims and the sacred laws of the prophets. So some people will tell you, depending on which school they... This is historical, but some people will say like, oh, because you can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore it's like, a, it's like an imagination, it's like a, an illusion of some sort. And No, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you're going to see Him. You're going to see Him. However, He intended that vision to be seen. Any point that we mentioned regarding the interpretation of Basar and Nadar, that's just our humble kind of attempts at understanding the, the nuances of language and the beauty of the Qur'an itself, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these subtleties of language and terminologies to indicate something that does not, that actually in congruence with the overall message of Laysa Kamithli Shay, there's nothing like unto Him. So He doesn't even leave this window of, of doubt for you. That, wait a minute, is this anthropology? No, he doesn't. He gives you this term that doesn't indicate that at all. Um, but when we talk about the see, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is affirmed in the Quran. As to how that happens, what takes place, modalities of that, that's as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended with that. And that should be sufficient for us. And this is, you know, the... <laughs> Subhanallah, the more you delve into aqidah studies and the more you uh, get into these texts, 
you actually start to see the point that Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi was making when he says, Allahumma imanuka iman al-ajais. Oh Allah, belief like the belief of old women. You know, that all of these high, lofty discussions and things, at the end of the day, you you realize the limitations. The more knowledge you get, the more you become aware of your lack of knowledge. And then you start to accept the basics. You start to see the beauty of how basic this religion is. And then you actually start to appreciate the the, the experiences that you have. Ma'rifah is a different level of knowledge. It's not something that will lend itself to the language. Um, even even um, uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, he even talks in his, um, I believe it was in his intro to Fusus al-Hikam, if I recall correctly, where he just he just states what he, his beliefs are. And it's basic, basic, basic Islamic beliefs. He doesn't go into all of this um, metaphorical, symbolic language that he has in Al-Futuhat al makiyah or any of his other texts. Just very basic beliefs in Allah, the Messenger, the, what the Qur'an said. It just says, it is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended it to be. And that's it. وَمَن لَمْ يَتَوَقَّ النَّفْيَ وَالتَّشْبِيهَ زَلَّ وَلَمْ يُصِبِ التَّنْزِيهَ Whoever does not guard, so this is the 45th statement, whoever does not guard against denying God's attributes and against anthropomorphism has failed, has erred and failed to acquire understanding of divine transcendence. You see, this is, um, this is why Sheikh Hamza in his translation, he said, at the start, in the introduction, he said, the job of the theologian is the squaring of the circle. And I mentioned to you, it's like, it's because uh, it's better to say it's to reveal the circle that surrounds the square. Our thoughts are linear because we are subject to space and time and we think of things in linear ways. So our thinking is, is a square thinking. We're in a box, but there is a circle outside of it. And your job is to step outside of that box and see the actual circle. And when it comes to this, we continue to assert the transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while at the same time, asserting these paradoxical positions of you can still have a relationship with him you will see him on the day of judgment that Allah has speech you know these things that are they're mysteries they're um, but they're not mysteries in the way that Catholics will talk about the Trinity because for them when they say mystery they're trying to negate they're trying to get your mind away from the irrationality of the proposition that God can come into the world and then be punished and crucified and somehow that absolves everyone else from the original sin of Adam alayhi salam and all of that. That's what they talk about in terms of mystery. For us, mystery in the sense that our intellect cannot comprehend um, and it goes beyond the supra-rational. It is not irrational, it's supra-rational. And so he says that if you do not, you have to guard, you have to be very careful not to deny the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time be careful not to anthropomorphize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assert what Allah asserted for himself and deny what Allah denied for himself. فَإِنَّ رَبَّنَا عَجَّلَّ وَعَلَى مَوْصُوفٌ بِصِفَاتِ الْوَحْدَانِيَةِ مَنْعُوتٌ بِنُنُوتِ الْفَرْدَانِيَةِ لَيْسَ بِمَعْنَاهُ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْبَرِيَةِ So the 46th statement is for undoubtedly our Lord the sublime and exalted is described with the attributes of unity and uniqueness. No one in creation is in any way like him. وَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْحُدُودِ وَالْغَيَاتِ وَالْأَرْكَانِ وَالْأَعْضَاءِ وَالْأَدَوَاتِ لَا تَحْوِيهِ الْجِهَاتُ سِتُّ كَسَائِرِ الْمُتَّعَاتِ And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is transcendent, transcendent beyond limits, ends, supports, components, or instruments. The six directions do not contain him as they do created things. See, should we go on? Maybe a little bit longer. Uh, 48 statement. وَالْمِعْرَاجُ حَقٌ وَقُدْ أُسْرِيَ بِالنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَعُرِجَ بِشَخْصِهِ فِي الْيَقَاضَةِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ إِلَى حَيْثُ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْعُلَاء وَأَكْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِمَا شَاءَ وَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِ مَا أَوْحَى مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى فَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى 
So the ascension is true. So remember, uh, we talked, I think it was last time, about the, the Isra and the Mi'raj and going to Jerusalem. And so he, here he just speaks specifically about, um, he speaks about bo- both of those things. Uh, but he makes special mention of the Mi'raj with some more detail. Um, the ascension is true. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was taken by night, and this is why Abu Bakr Siddiq radhiAllahu anhu was called the Siddiq, because when he woke up the next day, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was telling Quraysh about this, and they were mocking and joking and laughing, saying that, and went to Abu Bakr Siddiq radhiAllahu anhu and said, "Your friend is saying that he went to Jerusalem last night and came back. Like, are you still going to believe? Kind of a thing. Like, look how silly of a claim that is." And he, radiallahu anhu, said, if, if he did say that, in kana qalahu, if he actually said that, then he's, he, it happened. In other words, I believe him, but I don't believe that you're actually transmitting the news accurately. So if he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, actually said that, that's true, I believe it. I don't believe you first. I need to go confirm that that's what he said. And that's when he got given the term, his name Abdullah ibn Abi Quhafa is the real name of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and Al Siddiq came out of that is he's so unwavering in his belief of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no doubt whatsoever and it was a reflexive response that's what he said then that's what happened and then Imam you Tahawi know, here says that وَعُرِجَ بِشَخْصِهِ so the ascension is true the Prophet sallam was taken by night and ascended in person and consciously to the heavenly realm. And from there, to wherever God willed in the celestial heights, God honored him with what he willed and revealed to him that which he revealed. He, his mind did not imagine what he saw. May God bless him and grant him peace in this and the final abode. So there are some differences between the scholars regarding um, that the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, yeah, he was taken physically from Mecca to Jerusalem. But did the ascension go just with his soul, his spirit up, or was he fully physically together and awakened for that process? And the position of Al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah is that he was taken up completely. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ascended the heavens. Oh, what happened to the oxygen and don't you need this? And No, none of that stuff matters. This is called, it's possible. If you remember the rules of possible, impossible, and necessary, just because you haven't seen something happen doesn't mean that it can't happen. I mean, you watch a movie like Aquaman, and you have, uh, uh, what's his name? Momoa, Jason Momoa. You watch him in Aquaman, swimming inside the ocean without any oxygen, and going into the depths of it, sustaining all kinds of pressures. I mean, if you think about the physics of Aquaman, it's crazy. His skin, his lungs, his bones, like just the density of his body. Um, the speed by which he moves, the oxygen that he breathes, that's so much that goes into, I and mean, why does a whale have to be the physics, the physicality of the whale? Why does it have to be the way that it is? A lot of it has to do with where to the depths that it uh, delves in, dives into. Um, the skin has to withstand certain pressures. The size of it has to, there's, there's like an explanation, a rational, logical explanation for the shape of a whale and the conditions that it lives in. But Jason Momoa in Aquaman can just go right into the depths of the ocean and do that. That's possible. That's what you can imagine. It means it's possible. So he can do that in the depths of the ocean. And when you see a movie and we have fun and we enjoy it, you can't give, you can't grant Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You give the directors and the producers of Hollywood the wherewithal and the entertainment. I'll entertain this possibility and enjoy your movie for a couple of hours. You don't want to entertain for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one with all of the power and the knowledge, to take his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam in physical form and ascend him into the heavens and show him things. I mean, that is actually more likely <laughs> than what any limited imagination of any Hollywood producer can give you. So we assert that. We believe that as part of our aqidah. Because this is a mutawatir narration. This is something that the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ha, uh, has gone through. The Sahaba narrated it to us. Um, it is where we got our prayers prescribed to us. So that's another reason why you have to believe in this. Because the source of the prayer itself, yeah, it's in the Quran. But the specifics of it, 
the five daily prayers that came in the Mi'raj, not in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about three times in, of prayer in the Quran. أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِدُرُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَزَقِ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مَشْهُودًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just mentions three times in the Quran about prayer. But the five prayers came from the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he received them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And that's why prayer is important. Everything else came through revelation with Jibreel alayhi salam. But this thing came directly as a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many of you know the story. It started off with 50. He'd come down. He'd meet with Musa alayhi salam. And he'd say, your people are not going to be able to handle it. And he went back and forth until he got down to five. And then he saw Hassan and said, I'm too shy now. Like I've taken it down. Not only did I get five, I get the reward of 50. I can't keep going back to my Lord and asking for less prayers. Which begs the question, how come Muslims can't even perform one sometimes? But you want to know this, the weight. And why did the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, The الْعَهْدُ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ The covenant that's between us and them, he's talking about the believers, is prayer. Whoever leaves it and abandons it, they have disbelieved. Now the scholars do talk about, did he leave it juhudan or kasalan? Is it because they're denying the prayer or are they just lazy? And if they're lazy, then they're still a believer. And if they're denying the prayer, then they're a disbeliever. There's a difference in that. But the point is, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded directly. And he said, I want you to pray five daily prayers. So when the prayer time comes, you should do everything within your means. It's like everything's got to stop. I got to pray. <coughs> and alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. Big window for prayer that you have. It's not like this second right now you have to start. Like there's a, a vast window for you to pray your prayer and to get up and to do it. وَالْحَوْضُ الَّذِي أَكْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِهِ غِيَاثًا لِأُمَّتِهِ حَقٌ And the pool or the, uh, that God has honored him with as solace for his community is real. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this basin, this pool, where you will drink, a uh, drink from it, you will never be thirsty afterwards. And that is going to be on a day where there is no shade except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shade. And people will be bewildered and confused and, and fear and will be running to everyone asking for intercession and for help. And the only one that will actually answer the call is the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. And it's amazing, you know, it's um, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's, the angels will be warding some people off from the hawd. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say like, leave them, these are my people, these are my ummah. And the angels will say, you don't know what they've done after you. You don't know what they've changed and altered and messed up after you. And he saw Salam says, Suhkan, Suhkan, Bu'dan, Bu'dan, like, get away from me at that time. La ilaha illallah. And the way that he saw Salam knows you on the day of judgment is by the signs of the, of the wudu, which also indicates the importance of the prayer. Because he doesn't know your face. But he will know if you've been making wudu because you'll come like a uh, uh, muhajjal is the term that's used in Arabic, which is those horses that have white in their, in, their, in their legs and white in their face. And it's because of the signs of the wudu. So if you're not praying and then you're trying to reform the religion because you want to make it adhere to Western liberal sensibilities or capitalist sensibilities or whatever it is that people want to make it into now, how do you expect, like, by what right do you expect to be in the company of the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Allahumma Sallim. Yeah, so Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, The shafa'at that he gave to them is true, as it is written in the news. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ta'ala wa Sallam's intercession um, uh, that God has deferred for, him, for them is true, as narrated in the traditions. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this shafa'a is for the people of, of even kaba'ir. You know, people that commit evil, grave sins. That's who he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes after and he tries to save, to save from the fire. And we believe in that. You're going to be fleeing from your mother, your father, your spouse, your children, everybody, your friends. It's going to be, everybody's going to be fleeing from everyone and saying, nafsi, nafsi, except for the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going to be saying, ummati, ummati. 
my people, my people, my community, my community. And he's going to be looking for us. And he's going to be trying to save all of us from, from grave punishment. And especially those who have committed evil actions, grave sins, adultery, murder, theft. And we believe in that and we affirm it and we assert it. وَالْمِثَاقُ الَّذِي أَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مِنْ آدَمَ وَذُرِّيَّتِهِ حَقٌ And the covenant that God made with Adam alayhi salam and his progeny is true. I think we'll um, stop with this particular statement um, because it goes on into another lengthy discussion um, that is related to our previous discussion on free will, inshallah. So, We'll pause it here. So we're statement 51. Um, yeah. Do you guys have any questions about this? Pretty clear? Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. We're making, what? we're making headway. Alhamdulillah. Um, I do hope that you guys are reviewing this. Um, even if you just came reading before you um, come and take on the new the new lesson. All right, that I think will close it off. Subhanallah wa bihamdika. Shadu Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.